Let's talk to him. Dear God, it is a battle down here. We need those words. We shall study. One day we shall study war no more, and we will walk in the light. All the hurting hearts who are gathered here with smiles on their faces because we don't tell people how we're really feeling. The world just beyond these walls, desperately in need. What are we going to do? Teach us. Speak to us. We pray in the Holy Scripture. We, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going through my library the other day, and I'm pulling out books. I said, do I have any books starting a new grow group called Against the Strongholds, Praying East and West? Do I have any books? Do I have any books? A seminary professor, a friend of mine, called me. Got up 3 o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning, woke up. Sunday morning? Yeah, he said, I just felt impressed to pray. What? I want to pray for Japan. Oh, you'd heard that report we shared, what was it, a few weeks ago about Japan, the, the, the massive needs in that country. He says, Dwight, I'm telling you what, we don't need namby-pamby praying now. We got we to pray against the strongholds, man. This is, this is big business. This is huge for the kingdom. Well, he's right. I talked to some other prayer leaders. They said, he's absolutely right. So plans are being put into operation to one day have a day of fasting and prayer on this campus. But anyway, so I'm looking at all these books, and I'm thinking, what, what kind of strategic praying do you do? What kind of militant praying is it that we're supposed to do? Radical praying to go against the strongholds. God knows these strongholds are shooting up faster than we can put our fingers in the dike. So what are we supposed to do? I mean, the whole world's a stronghold. You got Japan, you got the U.S., even campuses, even congregations, even our own hearts can be strongholds. How do we keep from being overcome, overrun? So we got this Wednesday night, 7 o'clock over in the youth chapel. Come and join us. We had 39 sign up this last week. I really believe the more we have praying in this battle against the strongholds, the more power is unleashed. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Come and join us if you have the time. Anyway, so I'm pulling out these books, and I come across a book. You're not going to believe this. How do you have a book in your library you've never read? Written by somebody you've never heard of, R.A. Torrey. Ever heard of him? R.A. Torrey. I open it up. I spot a line just like that, and I'm saying, no way. I'm sharing the line with you, and that's what I'm going to do right now. I want you to get a little context for the line. Open your Bible with me to the book of Romans, please. Romans chapter, everybody knows the book of Romans. Romans chapter 15. I'll bet you that if you've ever read the book of Romans through, I know you've read this, but I'll bet just like me, you blew through this verse as if nothing were there but a passionate appeal. Paul said, oh, please pray for me. Pray for me. Take a look at this. What did we miss when we didn't read slowly? Romans chapter 15. Then I'll share that little uh, oratory line. So this is Romans chapter 15. You didn't bring a Bible, grab the pew Bible in front of you. You don't want to have a Bible, but you want to use your device? Fine, look it up there. It's Romans 15, verse 30. This is the NIV. Put it on the screen for you. I urge you, Paul writing, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. I mean, this is pretty dramatic. I'm begging you. Some of your translations read, I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. Pray for me. You, you will never have a full appreciation of what your prayers for other people, what the impact they have. What happens when just little old you pray? You pray for this little old pastor. I'm telling you what. Do, do we need each other's prayer? Paul says, I'm pleading with you. And you tuck right in this line. He says, I'm praying, I, I, I ask that you pray as I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus and, did you catch that, I come to you in the love of the Spirit. Now, hit the pause button right there. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not just about praying. There's this little phrase tucked away, but you, do you know what that little phrase dramatically is telling us? Get this. The Holy Spirit is a divine person who loves you personally. There are all kinds of people around, maybe even on this campus. There are people who think, you know, the Holy Spirit is just this little kind of ethereal cloud from God that hovers over the earth, embracing all people with God's love. That's not wrong. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's not an it. The Holy Spirit is a he. I had a woman come up to me after a young mother. I met her in the hall as I'm walking around just before walking to this front pew, and she says, Dwight, my name is Carolyn, and I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit's not a he. He's, a, he's also a she. Well, she's right. We try to use our, our human pronouns to capture God. You can't. The point is, 
He, she is not an it. That's the point. Not an it. Too many people just, well, this is a, you know, the Holy Spirit means the spirit from God, this mind of God, the heart of God. Wrong, 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 wrong. And by the way, what do we just read about the Holy Spirit? The love of those, the love of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit loves you personally. He says, ah, Dwight, who cares? Ethereal spirit or personal being. What's, it, what's the difference? You, you want to know what the difference is? Here comes the oratory line. I want you to look this up right now. It's in your study guide. Pull it out. Let's, let's go to that oratory line. The, does, this, does this tell it like it is? Absolutely. Study guide's in your worship bulletin. You didn't get a worship bulletin when you came in? Come on. We've got some friendly ushers who are just itching to come your way. Ushers, thank you, please, for standing up right now and distributing these, um, these study guides. Hold your hand up. Take some, you see, they have to sit in other places in the church because we're going to receive our Connect cards in a moment. But don't worry. Give them a little time. And those of you watching right now, let me put a website on the screen for you so that you can get this website. You can get the study guide. You see it on your screen? There it is now, www.newperceptions.tv. Go to that website. Some of you are live streaming or are already there, but you're watching on a television somewhere. You're listening on a radio. Go to that website, newperceptions.tv. You're looking for this teaching, King of Hearts. Can you feel the love? When you find that teaching, click onto it. You'll have the study guide. You're going to want this uh, R.A. Tory quote. All right, so up in the balcony, they're getting to you there. Okay, let's go. I'm not going to wait. Let's, uh, by the way, jot down Romans 15:30 while we're here. Would you please jot it down? I urge you, brothers and sisters, it's in your study guide, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit. Wow, that's, that's unusual. Look at that. By the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Now, here it comes. Ari Tori, I promised it to you. It's on the screen. You'll need to fill it in. It is of the highest importance, Tori writes, from a practical standpoint, that we know the Holy Spirit as a capital P person. Don't worry about the pronoun gender. He's a capital P person. To think of the Spirit as merely an influence or power, and it. Then your thought will constantly be, yo, how can I get hold of the Holy Spirit and use it? How can I get more of the Holy Spirit? Oh, write that in. Now watch how he flips the coin. Brilliant. But if you think of the Holy Spirit in the biblical way as a person of divine majesty and glory, your thought will be, how can the Holy Spirit get a hold of me and use me? How can the Holy Spirit get more of me? Did you write that down? Man, that, that, that just changes radically the way you pray. Oh, God, give me more of the Holy Spirit. Give me more of the Holy Spirit. What if you and I are praying, oh, God, give more of me to the Holy Spirit. Give, give more of me to the Holy Spirit. I mean, can you believe this? Jot it down. The majestic, glorious being in person we think of as the third person of the Godhead loves. He personally loves you and me. Bible calls him a comforter. Bible calls him the friend. Bible calls him the advocate. Bible calls him the spirit of Yahweh. He's a personal being. He wants to be a friend with you forever and ever. <laughs> we can't deal with him as an it. Well, we don't realize that, in fact, right here in, in Romans 15, 30, Paul is in the midst of laying out what I believe is the most stunning portrayal of Trinity love anywhere in Scripture. I'm going to prove it to you right now. Come on. We're going to just walk through those pages in, in one split second. Everybody knows uh, Romans 5, 5. We, we do here because we began this series a few weeks ago with Romans 5, 5, and that's where he starts talking about the love of God. So just look at Romans 5, 5. You remember this verse? How's this go? And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through whom? Through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Would you jot that down, please? Romans 5, 5. The love of God. The love of God. Good news, Paul says. We are all loved to the, to the max by the God of the universe. But now Paul will carefully begin to differentiate the love of God. Watch this. Drop down to verse 8. Verse 8, you know verse 8, perhaps, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's obviously talking about the Father because it's not Christ. So the Father, would you jot that down, please? Romans 5, 8, the love of, he's just described the love of God the Father. Now turn a couple pages over to uh, Romans chapter 8. Drop down to verse 35, Paul, St. Paul, still writing, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Wow. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword or flood? Nothing can separate us 
from the love of Christ. There it is. Clearly, the love of God the Son. So we have the love of God the Father. Now we have the love of God the Son. Fill that in, please. And then drop down, same chapter. Scholars call this the, uh, the, the, the rarefied air of the summit of entire, the, the entire Bible. The summit is right here. This is the top. This is the Mount Everest right here. Verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers. Verse, verse 39. Neither, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us, you and me, from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jot it down. So now we have Paul says, I'm and pull both those loves together. Mm -hmm. So I have the love of the love of the Father, and you have the love of God the Son. God the Father, God the Son. Paul, there's somebody else left. Ah, he's moving toward that somebody else. And that's the text that we began with a moment ago, chapter 15. Read it again, verse 30. I urge you, brothers and sisters, I'm begging you, some translations, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you by our Lord Jesus and by the love of the Spirit to join me in my struggle by praying for God praying to God for me. Would you jot that down, please? There's the final piece, the capstone, the love of God, the Holy Spirit. We have the love of God, the Son, God, the Father. We have the love of God, the Son. And now we have the love of God, the Holy Spirit. There they are, the three members of the triune God, three persons, one God. Can I get a little personal with you right now? I'm going to tell you something I do every now and then, every now and a blue moon when I'm having my own prayer beginning of the day. Sometimes I like to imagine that I'm going to right now step into the throne room of the universe. Someday I'm planning on it. Someday I'm planning that you'll do the same. I'm just counting on it. I may, but I, I like to imagine what that moment would be like. So I come to this massive door and it says, throne room. Oh, wow. So I reach up, little guy that I am, I reach up so they can hear the knock and I I knock, and the door slowly opens, and there is this tall being, white, and he looks down at me, and he says, hey, Dwight, we've been waiting for you. Come on in. It's Gabriel. Gabriel. He says, come on, follow me. I know why you're here. He says, and I'm, I'm walking in just like, I just, this, this, this ah, oh, this, you can't believe it, the glory. And then I see this white throne high and lifted up, and there's this brilliant light. And now the light is not a problem for me, but, but it's still brilliant, and there's a form. There's somebody sitting there. And I don't know about you, but you know what I would do next? I'm just thinking that probably I'd burst into tears. I'm just kind of a crybaby when I'm with God. And I would just start crying. And I'd be down on the golden floor with my nose pushed against that gold and just sobbing for joy. I can't believe it. I've dreamed of this day. Do you know how long I've dreamed of this? And then the being in the high and lifted up white throne speaks to me as if he were reading my heart. He said, Dwight, you've dreamed of it. Let me tell you something. We've been dreaming of it ever since you were born. Welcome. But I'm down there just sobbing away. And another person sitting right beside that, obviously God the Father, this other person comes down to me, and I feel a warm hand on my shoulder. And he taps it. And I look up, and I recognize his face. It's Jesus. And he just takes me, just pulls me up, and he puts me in this strong embrace, and I'm trying to breathe. And he said, oh, Dwight, my friend Dwight, wow, you're here. This is what I've lived for. And then, now here's the point. And then I hear a voice. I look up to see the, where the voice is coming from, and it's just somewhere over here near the throne. But, and the voice is smiling. Have you noticed that when you call people up on the phone, sometimes you can tell they're smiling even though you can't see their faces? There's something in a voice that's smiling. And the voice is smiling. And the voice says, Dwight, 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 it's so nice to see you. Do you know what? Ever since you were born, this is why I have hung with you day and night, the entire journey, just you and me. Welcome home, boy. This is your home now. Now, why do I tell you that? This little bit of imagination, which you really can't do. I tell you that to remind you that they're not just two persons in the throne room of the universe. 
There's a third person. And there's no law in humanity that says in order for you to be a real sentient being, you have to have physical form to be a being. That's just our very puny human thinking that says you've got to have something to move and moving lips and all that. You don't have to have that. He says, I'm a being. And I have love for you. As if there were nobody else in this universe, I love you and I want to be your friend. That's why I'm telling you. The third person of the Godhead is just as real as number one and number two. Same love, eternal. Same friendship, forever. Why are you telling me all this, Dwight? I'll tell you why I'm telling this to you. Because I want you, I want your, I want your heart to long. Begin to long for a friendship with the Holy Spirit. You and I have been, we've been having a long, continuing conversation going on around here, haven't we? I want you to become acquainted and friends with the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you another little secret about my prayer. I pray out loud. <laughs> I pray out loud unless there's something I don't want the devil to hear. But generally, it's just, I just pray out loud. There's nobody else in the room. I he, you know when I talk to him? Here's what I do. I imagine that he's right about there in my prayer closet. I have a certain place where I imagine he is. I see nothing. I know nothing. But I sense. And I talk to him. Now get this. He talks back to me. No, I'm serious. He talks back to me. It's not an audible voice. Karen couldn't be walking right by and say, hey, there are two people in there. It's only Dwight. What's, well, who's this other person? There's nothing anybody can hear. But you know what? You hear him. And you know the very sound of his voice right now. You know when he is talking to you. You recognize that voice. And one day when you have your private audience with the eternal, because there will be enough time in heaven for everybody to have a very special alone time with God. And all three of them, the Trinity, they're there. The moment the voice speaks, <laughs> that was you. That was me. That's why I wish that your heart would just long for this baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're not just doing this because there's nothing else to talk about. Because this is the peace that's missing. We've got to know him not as an it, but as a real, live, personal friend. Every morning. <laughs> every morning? Yeah, why not? Ask him every morning. Is there some sin with that? Hardly. In fact, Ari Torrey beautifully expresses the, 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 the companionship of the Holy Spirit. This is, this is so choice. This, the whole study guide is worth just this right here. It's, it's one very long sentence. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. You have to keep changing slides to get through this sentence. But you have it in your study guide. But, Torrey writing, but had it not been for the love of the Holy Spirit to me. Okay, so he says, look, I know I got the love of the Father. I know I have the love of the, of the, the, love of the Son. But had it not been for the love of the Holy Spirit to me, leading him to come down to this world in obedience to the Father and the Son, to seek me out in my lost condition, following me day after day and week after week and month after month, following me when I would not listen to him. When I deliberately turned my back upon him, when I insulted him, following me into places where it must have been agony for that holy one to go. Dwight, you're going here? You're going here? Okay. I'm with you. following me into places where it must have been agony for the whole, that holy one to go until at last he succeeded in bringing me to my senses and bringing me to realize my utterly lost condition and revealing the Lord Jesus to me as just the Savior whom I needed. And he induced me and he enabled me to receive the Lord Jesus as my Savior and Lord. If it had not been for this patient, long-suffering, never-wearying love of the Spirit of God to me, I would be a lost man today, end quote. That's the truth. You and I would not be having this conversation because neither one of us would be here had it not been for the third person of the Godhead who has stayed with you every single day and every single minute and every single second of your life. He has never, ever left you. And you're here because of it. 
and we act as if he doesn't exist. What's up with that? Wow. Tori's right. <laughs> Absolutely right. To the Holy Spirit, we owe everything, just as we do to the Father and just as we do this to the Son. I'm telling you the truth, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the King of hearts is the King of love forever and ever. Amen. He's the King of hearts. He's the King of love. All three. It's no wonder that in the middle of this stunning portrayal of Trinity love, Paul just slips it in. Very clever, Paul. He just slips it in. He said, I don't want to talk about your loving now. Watch this. Go to, go to chapter 13. He just slips this in, but we catch it. We see it. Uh, Romans 13, just turn back a page from 15. And uh, what's this? Verse 8. Paul writes, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Whoa, what law are you talking about, Paul? Why? Verse 9, the commandments. You should not commit adultery. You should not murder. You should not steal. You should not covet. And whatever other commandment there may be, they're all summed up in this one command. Love your whom? Love your whom? Call it out to me. Love your whom? Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. And finally, verse 10, love does no harm to a neighbor. <laughs> no. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. I'm going to tell you about a book that's taken this, the, the scholarly world by storm. It's a new translation of uh, the New Testament. It's written by David Hartley, David Hart, no, David Bentley Hart. Got it. A New Testament. Critically acclaimed. I wanted to get it for Christmas. Sold out, sold out. So it just came out in November. Sold out, sold out, sold out. And the reviews very critically acclaimed. I want you to see how David, David uh, Bentley Hart renders this line, Romans 13, 10. In fact, jot it down in your study guide so that you'll always have his rendition. This is, I, I, this, I like this. Romans 13, 10 from the New Testament, translated by David Bentley Hart. Here it goes. Love does not work evil against the neighbor. Now, here it comes. Hence, love is the full totality of the law. Now, that's a new way. That's a fresh way to put it. The full totality of the law. That's what love is. Oh, by the way, love is the full totality of the Trinity. That's who they are. That's why the law is just like them, because it's their law. The love is the full totality of the law, the full totality of the Trinity. So here's the question. What if we, I'm talking about you and me now, what if we asked the Holy Spirit to pour out Trinity love into our hearts every day before we go out into the world. Every day, just, just fill me with the love of the Father. Fill me with the love of the Spirit. F uh, love of the Son, rather. Fill me with your love, Holy Spirit. What if we ask the Holy Spirit specifically? Fill me with the full totality of your love, your, your grace. Fill me. Before going out, every day. Well, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be willing to do that, Dwight. Well, I, I'm telling you, that's all the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. That's what it is. Just fill me up. Empty me through the day so that I have to come back tomorrow morning. Fill me up again. Fill me with the full totality of your love, Holy Spirit. Wow. What if as a church we became known as a people who love deeply, who love boldly, who love radically around here? We who are so vigorously defending the fourth commandment, what if we decided to defend all ten of the commandments and the full totality of the law gets lived out in the way we treat our neighbors? What if that were the case? Fill me with the full totality of the law. Fill me with your love, Trinity. I mean, what if people got to know you, got to know me, because we're out there mingling with them, and, you know, they, they start saying, hey, I tell you what, these, these people, they're on that campus. Man, they'll love your socks off. Wouldn't it be a great, that'd be a great line? Come to me and I'll love your socks off. No, I'll come to you and love your socks off. I'll come to you. I'll come to where your trader once was. And I'll help scoop up what has to be thrown away. Are you serious? Yeah. No, no, no kid, no kid. Let me help you. Oh, I just want to go to church. <laughs> I just love sitting in these very soft pews. That's all I need. 
No, 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 no. The full totality of the law is the love of the Trinity. What if, what if we were, we were just plain a loving people every day? No crisis necessary. We're just plain a loving people all over this county. Loving people in a genuine I care for you sort of way. Would it make a difference? Would it make a difference? Are you asking me that? Ellen White, 100 years ago, put the words on the screen. You'll have to fill it in. Amazing sentence. If we would humble ourselves before God and be kind and courteous and tenderhearted and pitiful, in other words, full of pity, there would be 100 conversions to the truth where now there is only one. Go figure. 101. Some kind of hyperbole. Are you kidding? You know why? I know it's not hyperbole. Because when people can feel the love, then they seek the truth. If they can't feel the love, I'm telling you what, if you show up and say, I'm loving you right now, sir, come on, come here, let me love you. I'm just loving you real hard. But they can't feel it. Reminds me of Mark Twain. Mark Twain used to write about people who are good in the worst sense of the word. Oh, they're so right. They're so, oh, they're always so right. I just don't want to live next door to them. Good in the worst sense of the word. No, you got to feel the love. Because if I can't feel the love, I'm not going to believe whatever it is you believe. Because it obviously has not changed the way you live. Can you feel the love? Do they feel the love when I come around? It's like the little English girl prayed. Oh, God, make the bad people good and make the good people nice. Can they feel the love? Can they feel the love? A lot of people around here praying for God to send down the Holy Spirit and give us a big old revival that can make the cover of the Adventist Review, and then, boom, we'll go to heaven. Wrong. There will be no revival unless there's love. And there is no love unless they can feel the love when you're around. Because if they can't feel the love when you're around, it ain't love. Excuse me, I got an email from a viewer who said, quit using that kind of language. It's bad grammar. Okay. It is not love. If they can't feel it, trust me, you may think it's love. They're saying, it's not love. That's not love. That's duty. Can they feel the love when I walk into a room? Can they feel the love when you stop to gas up your car, when you step into, step into Gordon's? Can they feel the love up at Walmart? If they can't feel the love, why would they want to know the truth? You can have your truth. It doesn't make a hill of beans the way you live. I want to end with a story because this story tells it all. I'm hoping, I'm putting everything in this sermon on this story. You know, preachers ought to be very careful about doing that. But I'm putting everything in this sermon now on this story I'm going to read in your presence. And I'm praying you're going to get it. I'm praying that while you're hearing the story and you're going to love the story, that your mind is just going like this. The Holy Spirit is in your mind saying, hey, by the way, that's not just a story. That's why I'm talking to you, boy. I'm talking to you, girl. I need you to live this way. I need you to live this way, okay? I'm going to read a story. It's from Bob Goff's wonderful book. <laughs> Do I see my friends there? Bob Goff's wonderful book, Love Does. Karen and I have laughed and cried our way as we read the book out loud to each other. It's a wonderful book, Bob Goff. And our friends, Dave and Kim Sherman, gave us a copy. <laughs> oh, you got to get a copy. Anyway, okay, here's the story. Here's the story. So this is a first-person account. He's a lawyer, by the way. Don't let that prejudice you. When I was in high school, I met a guy named Randy. Oh, I love this. And Randy had three things I didn't have, a Triumph motorcycle, a beard, and a girlfriend. It just didn't seem fair. I mean, I wanted all three in ascending order. <laughs> I asked around and found out Randy didn't even go to that high school. He just hung around there. I had heard about guys like that and figured I should keep my distance, so I did. Later, I heard that Randy was a Christian and worked at an outfit called Young Life. I didn't know how much, I didn't know much about the, any of that stuff, but it helped explain the beard and made it okay that he was hanging out at the high school, I guess. Randy never offered me a ride on his motorcycle, but he tried to engage me in discussions of Jesus. I kept him at arm's length, but that didn't seem to chill his interest in finding out who I was and what I was about. I, I figured out maybe he didn't know anyone as own age, so we eventually became friends. I was a lousy student and found out that I could take a test to get a certificate that was the equivalent to a high school diploma. 
I couldn't figure out how to sign up for the test, though, which on reflection was a pretty good indicator that I should stay in high school. My plan was to move to Yosemite and spend my days climbing the massive granite cliffs at six feet, four inches, and 220 pounds as a high schooler. I really didn't have a rock, climber, rock climber's build. I wonder what made me think that there was a rock climber in me. You know, when you're in high school, you don't give much thought to what you can't do. For most people, that gets learned later, and for still fewer, it gets unlearned for the rest of life. At the beginning of my junior year, I decided it was time to leave high school and make the move. I'm going to go to Yosemite. I had a down vest, two red bandanas, a pair of rock climbing shoes, $75, and a VW Bug. I had one of those in college myself. What, but what else did I need? I'd find work in the valley. I'd spend my time off in the mountains, more out of courtesy than anything. Now, listen up. I swung by Randy's house first thing on a Sunday morning to say goodbye and to let him know I was leaving. I knocked on the door, and after a long couple of minutes, Randy answered. He was groggy and bedheaded. You ever seen yourself when you get out of bed? what your head looks like, he was looking like that. I had obviously woken him. I gave him the rundown of what I was doing. All the while, Randy stood patiently in the doorway, trying his best to suppress a puzzled expression. You, you're leaving soon, he asked when I had finished. Yeah, right now, actually. I said as I straightened my back and barreled my chest to show I meant business. Look, Randy, it's time for me to get out of here. I just came by to thank you for hanging out with me and being a great friend. Randy kept his earnest and concerned face, but he didn't say a word. Oh, hey, I inserted. Will you, tell your good, will, will you tell your girlfriend goodbye for me too? You know, when you see her next. Again, no, no words from Randy. He had this weird, faraway look on his face like he was looking right through me. He snapped back into our conversation. Hey, 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 hey Bob, would you wait here for a second while I check something out? No sweat, Randy. <laughs> Nothing but time now. What did I care? Randy disappeared for a few minutes into the house while I stood awkwardly on his porch with my hands shoved in my pockets. When he came back to the door, he had a tattered backpack hanging over his shoulder by one frayed strap and a sleeping bag under his other arm. He was focused and direct, and all he said was this, Bob, I'm with you. Hmm. Something in his words rang right through me. He didn't lecture me about how I was blowing it and throwing opportunities away by leaving high school. He didn't tell me I was a fool and that my idea would fall off the tracks on the way to the launch pad. He didn't tell me that I would surely crater even if I did briefly lift off. He was resolute, unequivocal, and had no agenda. He was with me. Despite the kind gesture, it was, gesture, it was pretty odd to think he wanted to come along. Um, sure, sure, I guess, I said half-heartedly. You sure? Yeah, Bob, I'm in. If you wouldn't mind, what if I caught a ride with you? Randy stood with a determined look. So let me, let me get this straight. You want to you drive to Yosemite with me right now? Yep, that's right. I can find my way back after we've got there and you have got settled in. I'm not sure why I accepted Randy's genuine self-invitation. I guess it's because it caught me totally off guard. No one had ever expressed an interest in me like that before. Sure, I stammered as we both stood awkwardly on his stoop. Uh, I guess we should get going then. And with that, Randy closed the door to his little house, and we walked side by side to my VW Bug. He plopped into the passenger seat and threw his stuff on the top of mine on the back seat. We got up to Yosemite before nightfall, and it occurred to me for the first time we had no place to stay. We had a couple of sleeping bags, no tent, and very little money, so we bedded down in an empty campground. The next morning, we woke up to a chilly but glorious morning in Yosemite Valley. To the north of us, El Capitan soared 3,000 feet straight up like a granite soldier. Half dome dominated the landscape to the east. These were my companions now. This was my cathedral. I was in the valley living room of my new home. Now, it was time to get a job and settle in. I rolled over my sleeping bag, thinking about how great it was to have Randy with me. I was a little nervous, but also excited about my newfound freedom. I was a man now. I felt my chin for any sign of whiskers. Nothing yet, but I shaved anyway, just in case. <laughs> Randy and I dusted off the stiffness that comes from tent camping, and we went to Camp Curry Company Cafeteria. I thought I could get a job flipping pancakes in the morning, which would then leave the rest of the day to climb. I finished a job application in front of the ma manager, handed it to him. He gave it right back. Sternly shaking his head, no. He didn't even pretend to be interested. But I was secretly thankful he at least humored me enough to let me apply. No matter, undaunted, 
I went to one of the rock climbing outfitters with a storefront in the valley. I told them I'd do whatever they needed. I was sure that what I lacked in experience I could make up for by what I lacked in maturity or raw intelligence. They said they didn't have any work for me either, that the jobs were tight and almost impossible to get in the valley. I walked out of the store discouraged, and I looked at Randy, <laughs> who was leaning against the VW. Rather than feeding my discouragement or saying, I told you so, Randy fed my soul with words of truth and perspective. Bob, you can do this thing if you want. You have the stuff it takes to pull it off. These guys don't know what they're missing. Let's try a few more places. And then just like he had said the day before on his porch, Randy reiterated his statement, either way, Bob, I'm with you. His words gave me tremendous comfort. <laughs> I applied at nearly every business in the valley and struck out every time. There simply were no jobs available and no hope of one opening up soon. Randy and I headed back to the campsite. We sat on the front bumper of my VW Bug and leaned back against its flimsy and slightly rusted hood that buckled slightly under our weight. The sun was getting low in the valley again, and the granite cliffs I had hoped to count as neighbors were casting long, dark shadows on the ground, each of the deepening shadows pointing toward the road exiting the valley. I had only a few bucks left after buying gas, and Randy offered to spring for dinner. And as we walked back out to the car after eating, I turned to Randy and I said, you know, Randy, you've been great coming with me and everything, but it looks like I'm striking out. I think what I'll do is head back and finish up high school. After a short pause, Randy said again what had become a comfort to me throughout the trip. Man, whatever you decide, just know that either way, I'm with you, Bob. Randy had been with me, and I could tell that he was with me in spirit as much as with me in his presence. He was committed to me. He believed in me. I wasn't a project. I was his friend. I wondered if maybe all Christians operated this way. I didn't think so, because most of them I had met until that time were kind of wimpy and seemed to have more opinions about what or who they were against than who they were for. Without much more discussion, Randy and I exchanged a silent look and a nod, which meant we were done. Without a word, I hopped in the driver's seat of the car. Randy hopped in the passenger seat, and we followed the path cast by the long shadows the day before. I was going back. We did not, now listen, listen, here it comes. We did not talk much as we left Yosemite Valley, or for much of the way home for that matter. A dream of mine had just checked into hospice. And Randy was sensitive enough to know I needed some margin to think. We drove for five or six quiet hours. Every once in a while, Randy would check in on me in this confident, upbeat voice. Hey, how you doing, Bob? We pulled down some familiar streets and into Randy's driveway. There was another car in the drive next to Randy's that looked like his girlfriend's. She visited often. We walked up to the front door, and he opened it, and I walked in behind Randy uninvited, but somehow I still felt welcome. On the floor, I noticed a stack of plates and some wrapping paper, a coffee maker, some glasses. On the couch, there was a microwave half in a box. I didn't understand at first. I mean, had Randy just had a birthday or was it his girlfriend's? I mean, a microwave seemed like a weird way to celebrate someone's arrival into the world. I knew Randy wasn't moving because there wouldn't be wrapping paper. Then from around the corner, the other half of this couple bounded out and threw her arms around Randy. Welcome home, honey. Then the nickel dropped. I felt both sick and choked up in an instant. I realized that these were wedding presents on the floor. Randy and his girlfriend had just gotten married when I knocked on Randy's door that Sunday morning. But Randy didn't see just a high school kid who had disrupted the beginning of his marriage. He saw a kid who was about to jump the tracks. Instead of spending the early days of his marriage with his bride, he spent it with me sneaking into the back of a tent. Why? It was because Randy loved me, that's why. He saw the need and he did something about it. He didn't just say he was for me or with me. He was actually present with me. What I learned from Randy changed my view permanently about what it meant to have a friendship with Jesus. I learned the faith isn't about knowing all the right stuff or all about obeying a list, of rule, a list of rules. It's something more, something more costly because it involves being present and making a sacrifice. Perhaps that's why Jesus is sometimes called Emmanuel, God with us. I think that's what God had in mind for Jesus to be present, to be just with us. It's also what he had in mind for us when it comes to other people. Now his last sentence, 
I need you to get. It's in your study guide, and it'll be on the screen, and I'm going to read it to you. This is his last. The world can make you think that love can be picked up at a garage sale or enveloped in a Hallmark card. But the kind of love that God created and demonstrated is a costly one because it involves sacrifice and presence. It's a love that operates more like a sign language than being spoken outright. Oh, I like that. It operates like a sign language. What I learned from Randy about the brand of love Jesus offers is that it's more about presence. Write that in, will you? It's more about presence than undertaking a project. It's a brand of love that doesn't just think about good things or agree with them or talk about them. What I learned from Randy reinforced the simple truth that continues to weave itself into the tapestry of every great story. Write it down. Love does. Isn't that good? It's precisely what Calvary did. When God poured out his Trinity love on a, a race of runaway rebels like you and me, love does. It's what we do. When every morning we ask the Holy Spirit, fill me with Trinity love today, and then we go out and do. We don't just go out, we go out and do because love does. Love does. The question is, can you feel the love? No, 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 no. That, 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 that's not the right question. Can they feel the love? Can they? And you? Think of the last time someone said, I'm praying for you. Didn't it give you a sense of peace? and reassurance that somebody cares for me. I know how I feel when I get an email from one of our viewers saying, yo, Dwight, I've been praying for you lately. There's nothing like knowing someone is praying for you. So I wanna offer you an opportunity to partner. Let me, let us partner with you in prayer. If you have a special prayer request or a praise of thanksgiving you'd like to share with us, I'm inviting you to contact one of our friendly chaplains. It's simple to do. You can call our toll-free number, 877, the two words, His Will, 877, his will. That friendly voice that answers, you tell him, you tell her what your prayer need is. We'll join with you in that petition. And may the God who answers prayer journey with you these next few days until we're right back here together again next time.